church family, good morning, my friends. It's so good to see you today. God has given us a great invitation, and I'm glad to see you all here because I see that you have accepted the invitation to come worship Him today. Um, I invite you to join us as we not only accept His invitation to worship, but also invite His presence to join us today and also praise Him for who He is. Gracious Heavenly Father, first of all, we praise you for being God who created us and who has redeemed us and is soon to come back to take us to eternal home. We thank you and praise you for such a promise. And we thank you also for reminding us the time that we can set aside and come to worship you this Sabbath day. Our minds are so busy with the things of this earth. Without remembering this Sabbath, we can just go through this world with the currents of the world, then not knowing that your grace and mercy in our lives. So this morning, we thank you for reminding us and bringing us together to worship you, o Lord. We thank you for the body of Christ here together to praising you, praying you, and hear your word. We thank you for bringing us together to be a corporate body, to worship you, care for each other, and pray for each other, Lord. Thank you so much for such a blessing. Lord, this time, uh, we have our burdens in our hearts. We want to lift up the burdens and lift up our supplications. Lord, I pray that you will attend to our prayer, answer them according to your will. Hear our supplications, O oh Lord. I want to mention a few prayer requests this morning, O oh Lord. We want to pray for this church. You have raised up this lighthouse in this place to shine over this area. May we, this church, will do the commission that you have given us. May we come together as one body 
to reflect your grace and mercy to this world. Not only this church, O oh Lord, but our entire world body, we need your presence. We need the Holy Spirit that we will complete your mission that you have endowed to this Seventh-day Adventist church, the worldwide body. May we remember that. May we have that spiritual regeneration in our church today. Lord, we ask for the wisdom and discernment that we so much in need. Lord, help us. Leave us not on ourselves, but may you bless us with the wisdom and discernment that comes from on high, that we may understand your desires in our lives, and we may have a faith to fulfill them. Lord, we want to remember the Michigan uh, Conference camp meeting that begins tomorrow evening. Lord, we need a true spiritual revival and reformation. Lord, I pray that you will come near to and come into those camp meetings, that you bless that meetings, make sure everyone is safe and healthy and blessed with the word, rejuvenated with your spirit, so that the time will be a blessed time there at the camp meeting. Be with all those who are traveling and preparing for such a blessed meeting. I want to remember uh, Sriya's grandmother that having a eye surgery, Lord, be with the situation. Be with the uh, doctors and nurses and those who are involved caring for her. May the surgery be successful. She will heal quickly. Lord, we want to remember Isaiah. We've been praying for him, O oh Lord. You know the situation. He is growing. They need your guidance. Lord, I pray that you will bless their home, that Isaiah will be well taken care. There will be a point of bonding the family together as they always have been. May you hear their prayers and take care of him. And also I understand Jonah's also had a broken leg. Lord, I pray that you will care for him, heal him quickly, O oh Lord. Also want to remember uh, Gabby's dad, Brian, and his brother, Daniel. I don't know the full situation, but you do know. Lord, I pray that you will hear their prayer, you will hear their request, attend to their needs. So, Lord, at this time, we want to be silent and lift up the burdens and a prayer request from our hearts. Lord, I especially lift up Pastor Arm as he presents your message. May the Holy Spirit pour down on him, not a drops, not the sprinklings, but pouring of the Holy Spirit upon him that his message will break our stony hearts and replace it with the heart of a flesh. We pray with the Lord's prayer this time. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sin, as we forgive our sin. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be found in Matthew 8, 11 through 12, and 19 through 22. And it reads, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness, darkness and where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> uh, 
it's a blessing to have all of you during the summer season. And I thought that many of the students would be gone, but we're so glad that many of the students do stay. How many of you are student and still taking summer school? Crazy enough to take summer school. Okay, okay. Give them hearty amen. Amen, 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 amen. Not enough, but not enough. Give them hearty amen. Amen. Summer is also a sad time where many of us, many of our you know, members and students and seminarians who have been part of our church are leaving. And something that some of you may have been used to it, but I'm not still used to it. People leaving uh, the church, it saddens me uh, to, you know, crazy. And, uh, but uh, we're a transitional church. But I want you to know that, that our journey whether we continue to stay here at Living Word or not, our journey is a very unique journey which you all share with people from all over the world. And our, our journey together is a journey toward God. And more specifically, it is a journey toward heaven. Amen? How many of you truly believe in heaven? How many of you? Amen? Amen. And how many of you think that this earth is just so great enough that I don't need heaven in my life? And if you do that, you don't know life enough. <laughs> but I, I, I would not want to portray heaven in such a way that heaven is a cop-out. In other words, I don't want to promote anything that's false. We're not promoting false hope because life is so full of despair. It is not a crutch that we depend on. Biblical eschatology, it's a kind of big word, eschatology. It's a, it's, a, it's a theology about the end. But much more so, it is a perspective of life. It is a perspective of today, what it means to live today, and what kind of perspective that we need to have. I believe that there are two perspectives. One perspective has to do with just living and cru cruising along, living today and looking for tomorrow. That would be better than today. That is just, that is just secular and temporal way of life, a life of hedonism and life of pleasure and life of meaninglessness. And that is, the, that is the perspective that we all are familiar with. But there is another perspective that Bible talks about. It is the perspective that can forever change our lives if we really embrace that perspective into our heart. And that is a perspective called biblical eschatology. In other words, biblical eschatology is allowing you to look at now from the end perspective. I'm going to repeat that. There are two perspectives in life. One is that looking at the future from now. And if you're filled with despair, if life doesn't work out, if our lives are filled with, let's say, breakdowns in our lives, the stuff that you are longing to happen doesn't happen, so there is a breakdown in your life and in my life. Then if you try to look to the future from that place of breakdown, it's really hard for us to find hope. And you don't see the end. Only see is the dark turner that may continue on forever. When I was little, I had a chance to visit my um, mother's side of the family, which was really, really way out in the boonie called Yemi in Korea. <laughs> and there you, when you go there, there's a lot of turners. And they are actually, some of them are making turners. It's a very dangerous place to go. Because sometimes they use dynamite to blow up the mountain and all that. And we did something very, very crazy. We decided to go into the tunnel. And I could see that I was hearing something. It was the sound of train coming. And we had to get out, but we couldn't see the other side, nor this side or that side, and then we could only go in darkness. We were running and running. We thought we were going to die. The sound of train was getting closer and closer. 
luckily, we were able to find the hiding place. When you go into a tunnel, there's always a place where you can go in. And after the train left, we could con we continue on, continue on, continue on. Finally, we could see the glimpse of light from the other side. Oh, how happy we were. I am so thankful that God has not left us to live our lives as if we were going through the tunnel, not knowing when this tunnel will end, what will be on the other side. God has given us the gift of eschatology, which enables us to look at now, not look at tomorrow from, the, from today's perspective, look at now from the end perspective. We know our tomorrow is in Jesus Christ. We know Jesus Christ is our tomorrow. So we look at now from the tomorrow's perspective, so to speak. So we are not trying to figure things out, but we are living life from the end, and tomorrow allow us to give us the perspective for today, and then we live today knowing that our tomorrow is not only assured in Christ, but Christ has made it victorious for us. He has set the direction for us, and there is an eternal perspective we have, and we are marching on to heaven as we speak today. Amen? We're marching together. We are sojourners together. We're pilgrims. We're not gypsies. Gypsies don't know the direction, but pilgrims have the ultimate sense of direction. And I would like to take this message. Let's go on to the next slide. Matthew chapter 8 gives us a glimpse of something that will happen to all of us if you and I believe in this eschatology. What's the amazing thing is that this is the second part of the message that I shared about Cornelian. Cornelian was a Roman soldier who had 100 soldiers he was in charge. But then you found last weekend the Cornelian was someone who never gone to the synagogue. He's not a church member. He was outside of church. He's not the Jew, so he wasn't given with the light that, that, would, that had been passed down to them. And yet, Jesus called him as someone who possesses what? Greatest faith on earth. What? Someone who's outside of church has the greatest faith it almost like if you want to really find faith, you almost need to go outside of church. I'm not, saying don't, I'm not saying that you should stop coming to church. But I'm saying that it's good for us to go outside of church and find people possessing faith. And the Bible says that here is the Cornelian, guy by the name of Con the Cornelian. He, he, he was outside of church, and then he was, he was praised by Jesus for possessing what? Greatest faith on earth. And not only that, get this. Not the Jews, not Nicodemus, not Peter, not Paul, but this guy by the name of Cornel, this guy was shown as the model, model for the kind of people who will usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ, and who will be part of the kingdom of God, who will be part of the what? 144,000 people, the remnant of God. And so I was very inspired by this text. How in the world Cornelian played that role? How in the world Cornelian is that guy who represents who will be like in the end? What can we learn from Cornelian as to what it means to be saved and what it means to believe in the eschatology of God, what it means? And let's take a look at the scripture that's already been read, Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to just remind you of just one important point there that, that has truly touched my heart. Matthew chapter, let's take a look at chapter 8. Further on, verse 11, it says, I say to you, after he talked about Cornelian, and now he's taking 
the message of Cornelian, experience of Cornelian to a next level, to a level that is higher, fourth dimensional message. And he's saying that Cornelian represents someone universal. Cornelian represents someone in the end. Cornelian represents someone who is going to more than survive. He, he's going to represent someone who's going to be victorious in the end. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. And I say to you, I say to you, I'm reading from NIV, I say to you that what? Are you with me? I say to you that what? Many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Wow! Jesus is taking the message of Cornelian and now he's shifting to heaven and he's taking us to the end of the time. It's called eschatology, end of the time. And he's giving us the picture of what's going to happen when Jesus comes. When you and I are ushered into the kingdom of heaven, God will spread the feast, eternal potluck. People's face brighten up when I mention the word Pala. When I mention the word Jesus, like, <laughs> Jesus, believe in Pala. Do you like Jesus? Amen. <laughs> and he will, he will open up a feast that has no end. I think one of these days, we should have Pala like that. Just have one line. <gasps> representing the feast of heaven. And then Jesus will be sitting in the middle. And then Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And can you imagine all these people? The Peter and John. You know, all these people. Noah, who built the ark for 120 years. And first thing I want to say when I meet Noah, weren't you crazy? There's a lot of crazy people in the Bible. Nehemiah, all these people you're going to meet, and they're going to be a feast. And then Jesus is saying two things. Many, 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 many people, mucho people will come. <laughs> so many people will come. I like that. Many will come. And then he was saying, Cornelius, the centurion, I'm sorry, centurion was going to be there. Centurion was going to be there. By saying the centurion and his faith, the way he lived his life is a representative how you and I need to live our lives today. It's a model for us. Centurion is a model for us. Roman soldier who pierced the hands of Jesus with the nail represents the model as to how we think a Roman soldier in that way. But there's so much you and I can learn from Centurion about how we need to live our lives in this important time of our lives important time of this earth history. And I want to mention three things. Before I go on, let's go to the book of Revelation, talk about many people who will be saved. And I'm praying, it is my prayer, that every member of Living World Fellowship will be there. Amen? And I pray that it is your family members to be there. I pray for those who pray, we pray for, will be there. And, and, and it is my prayer that many will be there and all of us will be there. Let's take a look at book of Revelation. I have it on the slide here. After this, I looked and there before me. Let's all read it together. Let's all read it together. It's so powerful. Everybody, are we ready? Shall we? After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Wow. From every nation, tribe, 
people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Let's move on to the next slide. And it says, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Actually, Revelation chapter 7 is really, really, really powerful. If you continue on, you will find out that these are the people who are part of 144,000. And these are the people who has gone through two things, tribulations. And then they were washed by the blood of the Lamb. And then in the end, Jesus says that Jesus will wipe out their tears from their eyes. Do you have sorrows in your life? Do you have heartaches in your life? Do you have mournings that no one can understand? And I want you to know that Jesus not only is our hope, he has assured that he is going to usher in his kingdom that will stand forever and ever and ever. And Jesus was foresowing. You see, he was a prophet. Jesus was foresowing the end when he came to this earth to be with this centurion. And Jesus was making that prophets. Jesus was seeing, you know, ahead of time that heaven is open. I want you to know that as we live our lives on this earth, we not only need to be heaven bound, but we need to live life from the perspective of heaven. Amen. Not only we are marching toward heaven, but we are what? We're living life from the heavenly perspective that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Centurion was there, is going to be there. And he says, Centurion will be part of that party. And I'm going to celebrate eternity with him. And then he says that if you look at Revelation chapter 7, this is a controversial subject. 144,000 will be the ones who represents those who overcome that insurmountable challenges in their lives. We shall overcome. Amen? You know, the slaves... African-American slaves, when they were going through hardship in the U.S., the one of the songs that they, they memorized and they sang, We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. I'm not going to sing again because no one said encore, but just kidding. <laughs> I would like to change one part of the song. Not only we shall overcome someday, we shall overcome one day that he has designated. Not only we shall overcome, but according to the Bible, we have already overcame. Amen? Amen. Through Christ. The joy that we have is not the kind of joy that life is working out and we're just so pleasantly happy and joyous and life is cruising along. We have a joy in our hearts because we have this eternal perspective that Jesus gives us. That we are able to look beyond what we cannot perceive on our own. 
Our eyes of faith sees beyond troubles, beyond suffering, beyond hardships in our lives. We look beyond, not only that, we look now from the end perspective, just like Stephen Covey says, look at now from the end perspective. We rejoice in our sufferings, not only knowing that we shall overcome, but we have already overcome it in Christ then we have all the right in the world to, listen to me, we have all the right in the world to our defense, the joy of heaven, to borrowing the joy of heaven and bring it now in the midst of what we may not be able to overcome on our own. Joy of heaven is real. Eschatology is real. Tomorrow that Jesus assures for us is real. How? Well, three things I want to share with you today. Number one, one thing that, that Centurion has modeled for us is that just say the word then it shall be done unto me. Just say the word, and it shall be done unto me. In other words, Centurion has given us the model, given us an example as to what it means to have faith, not in how I feel, not in what goes on in my life, but in what Jesus says, in what he says. Just believing in the word of God. The Roman soldier understood through the power of the Holy Spirit, believe and experience the authority of God's word, the power of God's word. Amen? It is the word of God. It is the word of God that he believed in saved him. It is the word of God that he believed in saved his servant. It is the word of God, nothing else, nothing more. Those who shall overcome the evil, those who will, shall overcome the word, we shall overcome the word not with our zeals, not with our strength, not with our any political power, not with any wisdom and knowledge that we have, not with any earthly, you know, no knowledge or wisdom, anything that we can muster, we shall only overcome, we can only overcome through the power of God's word. The centurion believed in the ultimate authority of God's word. And he said, just say the word. He believed in the word of God more than anything. It is the word of God that will carry us through, my friend. It is the word of God. I must believe in the word of God more than anything. That's what's going to keep us. Actually, if you look at the sanctuary system, if you go into the holy place, there are three things in the holy place. On the right side, there's a table of what? Show bread. The bread. Table of showbreads, 12 breads are there. Why in the world, on the northern side of the sanctuary, there's a table of showbread? If you look at Book of Psalms, and thy shall spread a table before my enemies. The table of showbreads is none other than the word of God. Jesus is offering the word of God. This word will keep you. This word will sustain you. This word will keep you till the end. This word will allow you to be victorious. This word is everything that you need because this word is a personification and embodiment of what Jesus is all about. It is not just a letter. It is power of God. Just say the word. Oh, how much I desire in my heart, in the hearts of my children, in the hearts of my family, in the hearts of our living world, that anyone who walks into this place, 
Anyone who come in touch with our ministry, they come to believe and experience the power of God's word. Amen? Living word of God. Let's open God's word. There's one passage that are so powerful. It's found in 1 Peter. Some of the scriptures I intentionally not to put on the slides because you know if you if you keep depending on the slides all the time, you will never be able to find scriptures on your own. All right? We become lazy. God has given us five fingers. Why? To study the Bible. The Bible thumpers. We use our fingers to find scriptures, right? Okay? I don't mind you having, you know, cell phone, but it's good to have the written word of God. Written word of God. It's good to have a written word of God book. So next time you come to church, I want you to bring your Bible with you. Okay? You can't go to potluck without showing me your Bible. I got to use potluck tactics. <laughs> Where's your Bible? <laughs> okay? <laughs> your Bible, Bible. We need to find things. First Peter. First Peter. Chapter 1. Verse 24. Centurion modeled for us as to what it means to live life and fully be living in the ultimate authority and power of God's word. First Peter chapter 1, verse 24. Let's read it from verse 23. For, are you with me? Are you there yet? Okay, verse 23. I'll be reading it from NIV translation, and you can join me as, you, as I read it. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and what? Enduring word of God. Amen? And then verse 24. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. Everything fades and fall. Everything is under the power of mortality. And verse 25. But the word of the Lord stands, what? Forever. Amen? Shall we repeat that again together? For the what? For the word of the what? Lord stands, what? Forever. Let's, let's try one more time. For the Words of the Lord, what? Stand for him. Word of God never falls, never falls down, never fails. Word of God stands forever. Man may die, grass may die, trees may fall. Our security may bottom out, but the word of God will stand forever. And I, in that sense, I truly, truly appreciate Truly, truly appreciate the name of our church. Living what? Living Word Fellowship. And I'm going to give you one more scripture that mentions our church, our church's name. Well, I didn't know that. Bible mentions our church's name. Did you know that? Let's go to the book of Revelation. Let's see if I can find it. Revelation. I guess it depends on your translation. So my translation is better, I think. It mentions living word. <laughs> Revelation chapter 7. Actually, I was wrong. Wow, I thought it was a living word, but living water. <laughs> living word and living word. The word of the Lord stands what? Forever. You know what? One thing that my father gave me is the word of God. He didn't leave me with any inheritance. I heard that my father has some mountains in Korea. He owns two mountains in Korea. But it's of no use. It just takes forever to get there. And 
Jesus will come before that, that mountain will be of any value. So my brother is trying to give it away. <laughs> my father didn't give me anything but the word of God. I still remember my father every Sunday morning being in his office, in his house. In our, in our house, there's one room that is not heated. He deliberately made that room no heat coming in. So cold winter day, my father wears the jacket. He goes into that room, and then he study God's word all day long on Sunday. And my father tells me, son, the word of God that I chew on, just like brown rice 100 times, the word of God that I chew on on Sunday morning, Sunday all day, keep me for the rest of my life. It is the word of God. My father believed in the word of God. My father chewed on the word of God. My father died with the word of God. And I want you to know that 32 years of my ministry, if I have one testimony to share with you, and the testimony is, the word of God is living and alive and sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces my heart and it tells us what's wrong with my heart. The word of God pierces me in a way that nothing else can, no psychology can, no any counselor can. Word of God pierces you to your heart in such a way that it gets you to the core of who you are. And that when you are confronted by God's word, there is no escape but to what? Embrace and to fall down under the power of God's word. Centurion must have experienced the power and the authority of God's word. And then secondly, I want to quickly point out, Centurion was the one who was able to use his faith, not just to benefit himself, but use his faith to be exercised for the salvation of other people. Greatest faith is not something that you use on yourself. Oh, I got to be saved. No, no, he was looking beyond. He was able to use his faith to heal his servant, use his faith to bless the world, use his faith to lead others onto the kingdom of God because he had a greater burden in his heart, more than his own joy and happiness and success and prosperity on this earth. But he had his heart set on God, set on the word of God, set on the things that God wants us to care for. That is the salvation of our fellow man, fellow human being. Salvation of other people. When our faith takes on a mode where we use it to bless others, bring others unto the kingdom of God. When we are charged by the desire and passion to be mindful of the salvation of others. Today I have someone to honor. Angel came with her mother. Angel's mother is here with us. Would you stand, please? Sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't prepare you ahead of time. Sorry. Let's give her a big round of applause. Amen. <laughs> you want to get to know Angel's mom, you can be pleased, be seated, please. I had a chance to get to know her yesterday. She came over to our house. As I was talking, I was inspired by her. Because here's a woman who is in China who learned about Seventh-day Adventism, who learned about faith of Adventism, who learned about uh, medical missionary work. And God has called her Think about this. God has called her as a woman, as a young woman, to give her life for the salvation of other people. I told her, and after that I was kind of ashamed by that. 
I said, hey, since your daughter is getting married here, well, she's getting married here, you know, why don't you come to the United States? You know what she said? Pastor, um, I'll visit from time to time. But there's just so many I am taken care of. There's so many needing salvation. There's so many needing my hands in China. I cannot leave China. Her faith is 100% used, not just my own salvation, but the salvation of other people. Here's the trick. I'm not saying that we should not be concerned about our own salvation, but when we get lost in God, when we get lost in God, when we get completely, when we lose about ourselves for the salvation of other people, your salvation is assured. You know what Paul says? Lord, let my name be taken away. Moses also prayed, let my name be taken away so that these people would be saved. Please let the Israelites, my own brothers and sisters, to be saved, even if it takes for my name to be taken away. The word of God is a power that transforms our lives, our perspective, in such a way that we are envisioned by new vision of God that is a vision to care for the souls that are out there. And our hearts are overflowing, going out of us, touching lives for Christ. Centurion models as to what it means to have greatest faith. And that was exercise. And so I want to honor Angel's mom for how God has touched her. I know many of us here, many of us are inspiring me in that point of breakdown, what seemed to, what could have been a point of breakdown. God uses it to bring transformation in your life. And you being, many of you have that heart for God and reaching out for other people for Jesus Christ. In closing, I'm going to end with third point. And I hope that this third point may not be a point of disappointment. Hopefully, it will be a point of challenge for us. Matthew chapter 8 tells us that many who belong to the family, many those who had a right to be part of the family, they were taken out and insiders went out and outsiders came in and there was a shift Those who have received the light somehow faded away from the light while those who received the light firsthand, I mean, those who received the light just recently, they are getting excited and they're taking their places. And I'm not saying, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, it is so important for you and I to keep our faith alive in Christ because there's something that you can only do. There's something that I can only do. We got to keep our faith. Our faith needs to grow. Our faith needs to be prosperous and shine in such a way that the place that God has for our salvation, we need to keep it in such a way as we learn to go outside of us and bless others for God's kingdom. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you something. Inward bound Christianity, I'm going to end with this challenge. Inward bound Christianity, meaning that all we care is about us and inside of us and our own group and our own family. We should care about family. That's not what I'm saying. But if we become so inward bound, then we're going to lose the whole point. It is only when you and I become outward bound that our salvation even be assured. Because there is more to it than just being saved. Salvation is about extending the power of God's love and his salvation to others who may not have heard it before. I want to thank God for those who took a stand and took their faith 
to the next level. We cannot be lost. We cannot be lost. The place that God has given us, we must keep it in such a way. If you try to keep it and allowing that to be your foremost foremost goal, we may lose it. But when we lose ourselves, in order to keep the faith of other people, then our faith will be kept doubly, threefold, quadrifold, million times, hundred times. We need to work for the salvation of many. Many will be saved. Many will come. And it is my prayer that you and I are there and joining that journey with God. Heaven. Heaven is our, not only our goal, but we need to live our lives as we bring in the joy and the power and the heart of heaven here on this earth. Jesus says when you lose yourself, you will find yourself. When we try to keep ourselves, we'll lose it. Centurion learned what it means to live for God, what it means to use his faith to to explore for Jesus Christ. May God bless our journey onward together during this wonderful summertime. May our faith grow and abound in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for knowing that you will not leave us alone here on this earth. We're not like orphans lost forever. You are our heavenly Father. You have found us. You have promised that you will take us back home to be with you forever, where there will be no sorrow, no death, no separation. Lord, Before we get euphoric about heaven, Lord, we thank you for helping us to realize that heaven is about bringing that joy and the power and the salvation of heaven on this earth and experiencing it here together with the rest of the humanity. May you grow us. May you expand our capacity. May you build our faith when we do not have faith in you. May you give us the faith in God's word. May you give us the faith in you in that we would be the faith community of God and keep us in your faith till the end. May you journey with us as our shepherd and Lord and the king. May we be joining together, sojourning together, encouraging one another and empowering one another in the power of your word. May we continue to grow to be the faith community of God. Then may we impart the inspiration of God to those who do not know you. May you bless us on our journey of faith. We thank you for the promise of God for eternal, eternal heavenly feast. As we are about to join our feast together, may our Padla is a reminder and also a foretaste of heavenly feast that is about to come. May your day come soon. Maranatha. In Jesus' name, everyone say, Amen. Amen.